difference One cup at a time So be sure to grab your tea Grab a seat And tune in to Miss Liz Tea time, time, time Making a difference One cup at a time Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tea Time with Miss Liz. That's right. Tonight, we do have trigger warnings going out for this tea time. Uh, it will be popping up and down on the screen all night because tonight we are talking about a real-life murder. So uh, I do want my viewers and listeners out there to be prepared that this is going to be a deep, raw, strong tea. So let's get started with the disclaimer, and then I'm going to get Sherry in here with a quick bio read of her, and we're going to share a good strong cup of tea with you all tonight on Tea Time. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea times are done on Thursday in 2023, unless it's a rescheduled tea time or a uh, a surprise guest coming on that wants to have a special second cup of tea with Miss Liz. So a little bit about who I have sharing tonight. I have Sherry Aikenhead Aiken uh, joining me, and she's an award-winning communication professional and, and <clears throat> excuse me, and former journalist who has worked on at newspapers and magazines in Halifax, Toronto, and Edmonton, a mother of three boys, She's a recipient of the Canadian Process Club Women of Excellence Award, and she was the communication director at the Nova Scotia Department of Justice in 2008 when Carissa Boudoir was murdered. This is her first book. So let's get Sherry in here and let's start to share this tea. Welcome, Sherry. Hi, Miss Liz. Thanks for having me. It is an honor to have you here. Sherry, I'm going to start off, and you know that how this works. So who was Sherry as a little girl, and who is Sherry now? Uh, not all that different from when I was little, I don't think. I um, grew up in a small town, and I was a very oh, curious... Did I lose you? Oh, can you hear me? I got you now. Okay. I grew up in a small town in Nova Scotia, Fall River, and I was a real curious child. I... Um, wanted to know why things happened, um, where, who, what, and I had the makings of a journalist very young. So uh, my grandmother used to say I might have been a bit nosy. And um, I uh, wrote poems when I was young and then eventually decided 
by high school that I wanted to be a reporter. So how young were you when you started reporting? Well, I actually got my first reporting job when I was 16 and it was at a local newspaper um, writing obituaries. And then they um, allowed me to start taking photos and then start doing interviews. And uh, yeah, for the next 20 years, I had a very interesting career. Um, and it's always been advocacy journalism and um, fact base, but really curiosity still drives me today. I, I, I really like the, the, the layout of the book that we're going to talk about tonight and how you respected Carissa's memory. You know, uh, for anybody that is wanting to know what book we're going to be talking about tonight, you can see it in the back. It's called Mommy Don't. Uh, Sherry's going to get into it. And I'm, I also have the copy here. And we're going to we're going to go deep into this book and we're going to share Carissa's story. Sherry, Sherry, I want you to get started, just get started at the beginning of why you got involved in this case, how you got involved in the case and all that mm. good stuff. Sure. So as you mentioned in the intro, um, back in 2008, my journalism career, I had left to go into communications and I was working in the Nova Scotia Department of Justice. Um, at the time, I uh, knew um, all the inner back workings of media and the Justice Department. But what really uh, tugged at my heartstrings was honestly a mother like any other mother. I watched on television um, when Carissa disappeared. And it was about a year later that I sat in a courtroom in, in the third row and heard her mother confess to murdering her only child. And I felt just the absolute horror and pain of the community and the relatives. And I felt so upset myself as a mother. I just had to know how could a mother do this? And one day I will write this book. And that was in 2009. Um, and my book came out this year. So uh, Sherry, let's go back to who is Penny and who is Carissa for the viewers out there that might not know. So this story really starts with an ordinary, um, funny, uh, loving mother who works at a superstore as a cashier. She grew up in a very small uh, seaside town and um, she uh, was very well liked even by her whole family and Carissa's grandmothers and their, her in-laws. Um, no one could imagine this Penny could do something like this. She was thoughtful about the Christmas presents, remembered what everybody loved and the baking. She took Carissa to skating lessons, um, anything she wanted. Um, she really tried to give her. So um, this is what makes the story so intriguing is that it was absolute shock to her own family when it when the police um, suspected her. Um, she did have two failed relationships. So she got pregnant early um, in her teens um, by a really nice man that she met at the uh, working then at Sobeys. And um, it didn't work out. So she actually fell for his younger brother. Um, who uh, was three years younger and she ended up marrying the younger brother. And so together the three of them raised Carissa. Um, and um, by all accounts, you know, it, it even though um, there was a sharing of Carissa and sort of visitation and all that, Carissa had a lovely, you know, good upbringing by Penny. So this is what makes it just so horrible that, um, We'll get into it, but why she committed this. So, Sherry, we do have a question here. They're asking how old Penny was. She was 34 when this happened, and Carissa was a 12 years old. Kind of a little rebellious, um, you know, um, very fun-loving, perky little girl, but just normal teen times, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, if you want me to talk a little about Carissa, this, she is the reason I wrote this book. Um, to me, she had so much promise and um, it was a very strong, spunky little girl. Her grandmothers talk about um, what a wonderful 
reader she was. She loved animals. She knew already that she wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, she always stood up for her friends. And in this book, I interviewed three of her, her classmates and friends from way back when. So she was, um, she was just a very cheerful, kind girl who um, um, spent, you know, spent time at, at her grandmother's house, at her father's home. She loved camping. She loved puppies. She had cats, dogs. She just was really sweet, um, but very confused, you know, about where she should live, which brings us to this story. So Sherry, how did the search go about? How did, uh, did the missing of Carissa start? So this is uh, one of the most um, gripping parts of the book when it opens. Um, and I too um, was moved when I saw Penny go on television and she appears twice to say, um, my daughter's missing. We've driven around. We had a Sunday drive to try to have a heart to heart talk. You know, Penny wanted to try to make things a little better. Carissa had just moved in with her in Bridgewater three months earlier and things were getting a little tense in that apartment that she was living with, with Penny, her mom and her boyfriend, Vernon. So the story starts, opens with the day Carissa goes missing. It's a blizzard coming in Nova Scotia. Um, the two, the mother and daughter are having a Sunday afternoon ride and then they stop in a parking lot um, to get some groceries. And when Penny goes in to pick up a few items, she comes through the doors and Carissa is gone. And that night it snows. It's a terrible freezing evening and all Carissa had on her feet were two pink croc shoes and a vest and of course this in a little small town um, when Penny calls the police this sets off a huge search so and and this search was not once but twice correct so from that moment on um, over the next 13 days Penny goes on television to ask the community, and you may have seen these before, you know, people going on and saying, help me find my daughter. I, I, I don't know where she is. And she speaks in the camera directly to Carissa. She says to her, please come home, honey. We miss you. Your grandparents are here. We love you. If you're angry, the, the community thinks maybe Carissa has run away or maybe she has been kidnapped so the mother is distraught but some people even notice at that time that she is the mother's not really crying she's sort of um you know she has this look about her deer in the headlights so she does do with the police and with the grandmothers and the fathers an, an appeal to the public to try to help carissa and over the next 13 days the community gets very involved they search the riverbanks. They, um, on their lunch hours, you know, they put um, signs up all over her aunts and family, all over the um, community. They, um, you know, they start to get Interpol involved. They get police from, from not just our province of Nova Scotia, but right across Maine and the United States, everywhere looking for her. Yeah, because um, stories like this in Canada are not shared. You know, a lot of people are, were surprised by this story because Canada it doesn't share these stories. No, and you know, it. Uh, I think why it really caught everyone by the heartstrings is the longer it went on, people, you know, were worried. Like, it, it does someone have her kidnapped? Why haven't we heard from the kidnapper? Or did she fall? Like, was she trying to run somewhere like away from her mom just because she was angry about the fighting that was happening in their apartment, the, the arguing. Um, so it, it really, um, the community rallied around and um, no one could find anything. There was one pink croc found um, in a snowbank. Um, before her body was found. And that is when police did not tell the public, but they, they started to be very concerned that something terrible had happened. 
I watched all this on television. Many people did. People were donating money. They were wearing buttons. Um, the cashiers at the soup at the um, grocery store where where Vernon and her and her mom and Penny worked. They were uh, wearing Carissa pins and getting donations. They raised ten thousand dollars, like to help with the search within thirteen days. So do you, do you know what happened with that money? Sure. Yeah, that became a little controversial, of course, because at the time they were providing food for the searchers and the rescue parties and trying to help Penny and send over things to help her. She was acting a little suspicious and odd. People started to notice in the community for someone whose daughter was missing. She was shopping and then um, even went to a movie. Her aunt came down from Ontario to be with her. So something wasn't right, and and the community started to feel what has happened here. It all came to a head, of course, um, when her body was discovered. So, Sherry, if you could share a little, how was she found and who found her? Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, a Saturday afternoon, and a little boy who was... Um, in his car with his mom from out of town, not from here. They were going for a drive along the ocean and um, they came into Bridgewater and the little boy said, I need to stop for a pee. And um, the mother pulled over to a little turnaround spot on the bank of a river and the river flowed into the Atlantic Ocean. So this is the community that I'm describing. And the little boy went over to be private and looked over the river um, so no one would see him. And he looked down and he saw something um, up through the snow and he screamed and he said, I, I, you know, I think there's a person down there. And it was her frozen toes sticking through the snow. And so immediately they phoned police and, um, they even carry some trauma today, that little boy I know, which is so many, so many people impacted. Um, but you can imagine the fear and upset when he, when he comes to learn what really has happened. So the medical examiner comes from Halifax and the police all come. And poor Carissa is found down by the water, down a bank where she had obviously been rolled, uh, rolled down and her jeans are down and um, her Winnie the Pooh underwear are down by her knees and it is made to look like someone sexually assaulted her when in fact that wasn't the case at all. But the person who did this wanted to sort of make police think that. So we them off the course, right? Exactly. So immediately there's heartbreak that weekend in the community and um, there's candle vigils um, right away because people think this must be Carissa. But unfortunately, the police can't even confirm it for the public um, until the autopsy is done. Um, and that took a number of, of a week. But um, hundreds of people turned out to um, the local church uh, and were praying that night. And um, I think they just really felt so sad that you know, they couldn't protect this child. They had only ha ever had one murder in the history of the town. And so that this child, innocent child, who had only moved there three months early, you know, her teachers, her classmates, everyone felt like, you know, how did this happen? There was absolute shock and despair. And of course, at this point, they have no idea that it's the mother. They won't know that for a long time yet, for months later. I, I think it's really sad that she went to that degree, you know, not to get caught and to get away with it. She almost did get away with this case. Uh, as we spoke prior to the interview, Sherry, is, you know, um, had it not been for some undercover investigation and stuff, she might have gotten away with this. You know, it, uh, it, it it's, it's so um, frightening to think that she almost did get away with murder because the police had no evidence, they had no witnesses,
But what they did have, and they were hearing, and people were calling, starting to call the police after Chris was found, a lot of arguing going on between Vernon and Penny, who up until this point, you know, they had been very much in love, living by themselves in this walk-up apartment. He had just proposed to Penny. Um, but after the death, there's a lot of arguing, a lot of drinking, a lot of screaming, a lot of um, eavesdropping. Um, and so police um, start to get their suspicions that, in fact, you know, she hadn't, you know, that maybe there was something off with with their stories. And they um, actually bring... Um, Penny and her boyfriend in for questioning and Penny's very smart woman. Um, she did not say a word in her interviews, so they couldn't, you know, they didn't have a lot to go on, but for the boyfriend, it becomes very clear to the police. You know, this man has a, a, a previous record of assault. He's kind of um, has a drinking problem. He's a very uh, low self-esteem and, um, they start to wonder initially, was it him? And so they set their sights on the boyfriend because it's always the boyfriend. It's never the mother. It's just even to think and say out loud, maybe it's the mother it was something the small town police and, and RCMP couldn't imagine, even though there had been a rumor mill starting to, to grow. So by February 14th, uh, Valentine's day, they bring the mom and boyfriend and arrest them for 24 hours and really put the questions on them and hope to get a confession and say, we know you did it. We've been hearing, we have, you know, overheard uh, things in your apartment. Um, your, you know, your stories don't make sense. And yet neither of them say anything. They put them in cells overnight separately and they put in undercover agents. And this is what sets the scene for plan B. If they could not get them to confess and they could not build a case with the public's help and asking people to report anything, they had to let them go the next morning. They walk out the door and the RCMP say to them, one of the officers says, look over your shoulder because we're going to be watching. So then they're released into their community and everyone has turned against them and they can't go anywhere. And Vernon, the boyfriend, he does rely on alcohol even more. And he goes to the liquor store and he sees the guy he met in the cell. Hey buddy, how are you? And at that point it's called the bump and they intentionally make them bump into each other and they decide we are going to start an undercover operation. So I'll just pause there in case you have any, or your viewers have any questions till we get to this point of this Mr. Big o operation. Yeah, we have a couple of questions that came in, Sherry. Uh, they wanna know who Vernon is. We really didn't get into who Vernon was besides him being the boyfriend, but was he like the stepfather? Was he the father? No, like no he, he was no relative. So she had the, her previous relationship was with uh, Shane and Paul, who were brothers. And she had, that was her pr only previous relationships in her life up until this 34. And Verna was someone that she worked with. And he was a night stock worker and she was a cashier. And she just was very flirty, Penny was. And the friends I interviewed from the, where they worked all said that, you know, you could quickly see them kind of falling in love. Penny always wanted a long lasting relationships to this day that she maintains that and was looking for that. Um, but Vernon was from Nova Scotia, but he just had a really checkered past and, and an assault and some other issues. What so were we some of the other questions? We have another question here. Did Vernon like Carissa? Excellent question. So Vernon was older. He was 45 and he, um, he has trauma in his past. In fact, Vernon, 
one almost feels very sorry for Vernon by the end of this story. He is a victim too. He had a previous wife and they had a child that died within a week and then they broke up. So Vernon tries to, um, tries to form a relationship with Carissa when she moves in and he gets her a fish tank and he gives her a Bible. This is a very religious family. So they read the Bible together um, and he gives her a teddy bear named Paws. And um, so he tries, but of course, if you're a young girl moving in with your mom and her boyfriend in a tiny cramped apartment where you can hear everything at night, you know, um, it's uncomfortable, right? Like it's, um, and, and Penny had set some very, very strict rules for Carissa. Um, the bedtimes of nine when, you know, her dad let her stay up later, like these kind of things that parents do. So there was, there was tension, but um, no ill will towards um, Carissa at all. The key thing here is he does say to Penny that weekend that she takes Carissa for the drive. He says to her, you got to go have a powwow. You got to have a heart to heart talk. We can't go on like all fighting and yelling here. You two got to work it out. How Penny interprets that is just, you know, so, so horrible. Turned out so horrible. So that is who Vernon is. The other thing that's happening when they go back into the community after they've been arrested, of course, people, you know, small towns, it takes 10 minutes before everybody figures out who was yeah. in there being questioned. And this town had rallied. I mean, they had written poems about Carissa. There was a song written about Carissa. They, um, there's a whole part of the book that talks about these teddy bears. And these are called Carissa bears. And at the memorial where she was found, this woman builds like a big um, wooden plaque dedicate it to Carissa, like right away, like right as, you know, within those weeks. And there are like hundreds, almost like almost 900 teddy bears that the classmates and everybody wanted to do something. So it's, you know, they bring stuffed animals and they bring flowers. And these bears stayed there for the next four months. And, and eventually this kind hearted woman who didn't even know Carissa gathers the bears she goes there at night like she's trying to protect them from all the elements and the rain and the freezing cold and she's you know men are coming like she told me the story about a man who wrote you know something to carissa on his matchbook and placed it at the memorial people were just so tormented and and, and saddened and these bears she collects them all and they take them to the laundromat and they they clean them and then they send the bears out to fire halls across Canada. And on it says, for you, in loving memory of Carissa Page Woodrow, 1995 to 2008. And the woman who did that gave me this bear when I wrote this book. Um, and I just think that's just so, speaks to how people felt they had to do something to show how, you know, they were affected. Well, and we, we talked about this before we went live. It was the impact of the community, right? The betrayal of the whole community was was taken advantage of by, by Penny. It was so hard for the community to find out what's going on. When are they going to catch the killer? Is there a killer within our, our midst? Like people were driving, locking their doors, which they normally don't do in these small towns. You know, they were driving their kids to their sports events. They were, they were terrified because no arrest, like nothing. So when they brought in Penny and Vernon, that changed everything because suddenly they didn't feel there was like some strange murder among their midst. They, they thought this is someone who lived here. This, this can't be. And yet um, Penny and Vernon have to leave. They leave Bridgewater, move to Halifax by April 1st because there's so much pressure and so much um, anger in that community. I mean, they had felt, you know, 
were we duped by this woman who went on TV and, and told us like who begged Carissa to come home? Like they were, they didn't know really what happened. That doesn't come out. They don't really find out until that day I was in court, but just the rumor mill and the Facebook pages and the videos. Um, so to move into the, I guess I would say the next key part of this story um, is the RCMP join forces with the Bridgewater police and they launch a Mr. Big operation. And in Canada, uh, that means you are able to, if you get warrants and go before the judge, you can wiretap and you can do almost anything um, to eavesdrop and set up um, a, a mob organization kind of business. And then what they did was, remember Vernon bumped into the guy in the liquor store? Well, I tracked down the undercover operator who came in and he became Vernon's best friends for the next four months. And he gave them odd jobs, delivering packages here and there and getting paid for it. And they had no money. By then the $10,000 um, was, was gone and they weren't working. And so... Vernon works for this this organization and he is so happy. He's like, I'm going to turn my life around. But Penny still, you know, I think Penny might have had something to do with the murder. So he tells his pal, this, this plain clothes pal, that he thinks, I have my suspicions. And undercover Steve, you know, he... Um, He's become Vernon's best friend, his boss. I mean, he takes them to Montreal, to Newfoundland. They've, you know, they're traveling together. It's all about earning trust because they want a confession. The police need some kind of evidence. And so when Vernon says, I think she might have had something to do with her daughter's murder, it cracks everything open because then undercover Steve says, we should focus on Penny. So they lure her. They say, Vernon, we need a woman now to help us in our business. Meanwhile, Vernon thinks this business is fantastic. In fact, he even sees a W5 documentary about Mr. Big Undercover Operations. And he says to Undercover Steve, Man, the police, we got to look out, you know, if they're still looking around at Penny, um, they set up these operations. And undercover Steve thinks he's been found out. But no, Vernon has no idea that the man sitting beside him is one of the best undercover operators. So they pull Penny in. He says, we need a woman. And Penny agrees to join. And that is her downfall. They bring in a female undercover, Karen. And um, day to day, um, their lives are doing like, like just doing runs of deliveries, this and that. But they take them out for dinner. They wine and dine them. They tell them they're going to buy them a house. We'll buy you a house uh, if you get promoted and if you keep working so well. And then Penny says, do you think you can help me with some of my legal problems? I'll just pause there in case your viewers have any questions. So we do have a question here that I think is really important. Where was Arisa, uh, Where was Carissa's father? Okay, so he was in Shelburne. He lived in Shelburne, which is about an hour from Bridgewater. So she would spend her weekends with her dad, Paul, with her stepfather, Shane, and her primary residence was with Penny and Bridgewater. So from the moment that his daughter disappeared, the dad came up, you know, the whole family came up. They all came together to look for Carissa. And it's only when the police really start having their suspicions, they tell the father. But they say, you can't talk about it publicly, but we think it may be. It may be Penny. So the climax, I guess, and fortunately for Justice and for Carissa, is that 
Penny is starting to, she's in Halifax, but she's really anxious that the police suspect her still because they warned her, we're going to be watching you. She tells her friend Karen, I'd like to blow up the DNA. I think they have DNA. I want to blow up the RCMP office in Chester. Can, do you know anyone who could make that happen? And of course, on the other end, listening to all this are the police officers and the investigative team. And so now they know they have an opening, a wedge. And um, they say, of course, if we can, we'll help you. We'll help you however you need it. But before we can do that, you're going to have to meet the boss, the Mr. Big. You're going to have to tell him what, why you need this gone and what actually happened in order for them to get rid of your problem. So we have another question here for you, Sherry. Did Penny suffer from mental illness? So no. Um, when we get to the core part, um, when she is arrested, Penny is uh, her defense lawyer, and she had a very good one. He does do a psychological assessment of her. And there is a uh, personality slight disorder, uh, an episode of depression. But there would need to be further because on the surface, there was nothing that would uh, qualify to try to, um, for the lack of a better word, get her off on those grounds. So we can... And and later, when I obtained her parole reports and her psychological assessments that I looked at, she was assessed three times in jail and uh, was not found to have a mental illness. So we do have a question in the studio. Uh, did, did you have to get approved by Penny or anyone to write this book? Excellent question. So... Um, I, you know, being a journalist, it was very important. I mean, I wrote this cause I wanted to honor Carissa's memory. So the very first person I started with before I even got going was someone in her family and it was her aunt chastity and chast, I picked chastity because she had written a victim statement on behalf of the family. The family was so traumatized by all this. Um, that she would be kind of the spokesperson back in 2008 and nine. So I met with chastity three times before um, we developed trust. And um, she also wanted to honor her niece's memory. And um, she fully cooperated with the book and she read the entire book cover to back before it was published. I did ask her dad to participate, but her fathers have really tried to move past this and they did not want to participate. I also wrote to Penny in jail three times. She has never spoken to a reporter or never commented publicly since this murder. And she is serving her sentence here. Uh, in our province and she declined. She knew a book was being read and I said, you can give your, you know, give people better understanding. They're all still searching for the why, but uh, she declined. So I hope that answers the question. So Sherry, how did they pull Penny in yeah. and, and get her to actually confess that she did this? So it was such a game. We're describing like the pressure on her and Vernon. They wanted to get on with the next step of their life. So when she thought she had an out with this, you know, person, this crime operation that we're going to, you know, get them a new home in another province, take them away. She saw that as her opportunity. And so they say, okay, come to this hotel and you can meet this under. Mr. Big, and you two have a private meeting, 
and then they will take care of your problems. Remember, it was the DNA and the evidence she was most. So she does in that hotel room that day uh, in June. By now, it's June. So this undercover operation, which cost roughly a million dollars, um, took from, it was actually quite fast because it went from February to June. And Penny in that room tells um, Mr. Big exactly what happened and that she thinks DNA may have been found because the police have found the clothing and um, she needs it to disappear so that she doesn't go to jail. So she doesn't realize she's confessing to someone who has a videotape and is taping the whole confession. She does do a reenactment. She even offers to drive the, the Mr. Big down an hour away down to Bridgewater and show him where she did everything. Every part of the story she walked them through, including where she killed Carissa and where she left her. Sherry, I want to get it out there because when we spoke before this interview, mm. it was a premeditated murder. I want the viewers and listeners to understand that. This was not just the moment they went for a drive. This mother actually mm -hmm. planned it. So if you could share a little bit of that, Sherry, because I think that's really important for the viewers and listeners to understand that this was not just a, a, an argument and just went. No. And you know what's so sad and heartbreaking? Even the undercover operator that I said was friends with them for so long, he didn't know how exactly what had happened. He was in the next room watching this through a screen, and he was so sick by what he heard. She did... Um, she did strangle her daughter and she did take with her twine to do that. And she packed it in the car that day. And then she took Carissa's clothes after it happened and put them around town, like try to get rid of the evidence. And he was watching and he just threw up as he heard this. So it's, it's horrifying. She did plant a phone call when she was in that Sobeys getting the groceries and she went on television and said Carissa was missing. She picked up the phone to Vernon, Vernon and said, help me find Carissa. She's not here. She's not in the, so I went in for a few items and she's disappeared. Well, Carissa was still in the car. So she had planted that phone call and the Crown prosecutors had a very hard time deciding whether to go to first degree premeditated, which would have been a longer sentence, but they settled on life sentence and it was controversial, but I can understand. They wanted to spare the family. They never made that, reduced that charge until they spoke to Paul and Shane um, about it. Meanwhile, the public has no idea all this has happened and they only find out uh, in January 2009, and that is the courtroom that I was in uh, when I was down in Bridgewater in my job, um, when Penny walks in and we think the trial is about to start. And instead she says, I plead guilty, I'm sorry. That's it. That's all she said. And wow. it is, she signed an agreed statement of facts. So that's how we're able to recreate the story so accurately is because the details of, of what happened, uh, some of them are all in a signed statement. So she just decided just to come out and just say, it's done, it's over, it's I'm guilty. Well, when they arrested her, she didn't speak. So she did the reenactment. You know, she thinks her problems are all going away. Um, but then the, the, miss, the police show up at her workplace and they um, arrest her. And at first she says nothing. And then they play the video for her. And then she just gives it up. And um, initially she does, she does plead not guilty. And the lawyer advises her that if we could reduce it to um, second degree, then your life sentence is 20 years. And so now as of this year, when my book came out, she has served 15. So she is now eligible for certain. She's been getting escorted passes 
out of prison. So her full sentence is 20, but in two years, she'll be able to go on day parole. And she has been a stellar inmate inside prison. Wow. So, has, you know, so what, what is, hurts everybody? Sure. Yeah, pardon? Where, where, is, is she, where is she today? Like you're, you're talking yeah. about the releases and that and, and, and where she can yeah. go to church and stuff like that. So is she like in a severe prison? Like, is she like a maximum prison or just a rehab, rehabit, you know? Like yeah, no, she is in the uh, Nova institution for women. It is one of the uh, jails across Canada. They're just for women. And it's actually a set of pods. And I, and, um, when you read the book, there's a whole section on her time in jail. And, and I, I, we won't get into it tonight, the whole backstory. Um, Cause I have all her parole reports. And when she goes to the parole hearings, um, but she's an hour away from Halifax. And um, basically it looks to me like seniors bungalows. Um, and she has earned certain privileges. She lives like in a four bedroom little complex where they make their own food, et cetera. And she is free to roam on the property. It has no, you know, she can walk around. Um, she has um, not allowed to use internet when you're in jail, not allowed to have a cell phone, but she does um, get these, applies for these personal development passes to go to church. So it is ironic she is very religious, always has been, and yet committed, you know, broke the commandment. I, I think that's what, when I, when I, because I haven't read the whole book yet, because I just, just got it. Just reading the beginning of the book, as a mom, how could you go to that degree? You know, we, we have these moments where we get frustrated with our children and that, but what degree does it take you to go to that extreme, you know? and premeditate it, not just do it in the spare of the moment of anger, mm -hmm. actually premeditate it and get the twine and make sure that she knew she was going for that drive and she planted that phone call and, you know. Well, fortunately, it's so rare for this to ever happen in Canada. Sometimes we see these cases in the States. They de definitely make headlines there, but it it has not happened in, in Canada very often. Um, she says, she want to interpret it Vernon's comment that you got to do something about this as she took it literally. And that was her interpretation of I've got a killer. And, um, you know, it, it's just, as you say, it's just unfathomable that you would go from, she had so many options. She could have asked Carissa to move back in with her dad an hour away. She could have suggested she live with her aunt or her grandmother's or, um, but at that time in her life, um, she did this and was quite calculating and, and cold about it. So we have a question here for you, Sherry. How does the family feel about Penny today? after mm -hmm. coming out and mm -hmm. saying she did it. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a lot of that in the book, um, her, her husband or Paul, uh, Chris's father, he, uh, he says he could never forgive her. She's never ever said, you know, explained why or, or shown any remorse. Um, so no one visits her. None of her family visit her on either side. Um, you'll read in the book that I did go to, to Penny's stepmothers. I went to her home and met her sister and her stepmother and they do not visit her and her stepmother. Um, I want to bring it back to Carissa because really that's what motivated me. When I met Carissa's grandmother, who was Penny's stepmother, my heart was just broken because it's still a shrine, her home to her. She has pictures of Carissa still all in her living room. She had a stroke after Carissa died. Um, like this girl was just such a joy for so many people. And um, so none of them visit her and none of them. Her dad did reconnect with her, um, but I don't believe he visits her. So we have another question, Sherry. 
does the community do a rally or a memorial mm -hmm. for her? Mm -hmm. um, great question. So for the first five years, Bridgewater, um, these two women, Chastity on Chastity, who participated in the book and gave me the photos and everything, they held, um, because Carissa wanted to be a veterinarian, they had pet drive in honor of Carissa for five years. And people would donate uh, pet food to the animal shelters. Um, and that was very successful. Um, and there's nowhere to give money. I mean, I personally made a donation to the vet, the shade, it's called, the um, animal hospital in Bridgewater as part of this book. Um, and people do go visit the memorial that's still there. And um, there are some, uh, her school that she went to, the Bridgewater Elementary, I believe they have like the year she was supposed to graduate in the June, like from grade six, they donated some books. So we have a uh, question here for you, Sherry. How has this book changed your life? Oh. It was really hard to write and research, uh, but I was so driven because I, I didn't want this swept under the rug. I was very determined and my family's was with me for the past. It took me five years. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, after that interview that I did with Penny's stepmother and sister, um, yeah, you're just, you're just, you just have to cry yourself and, and cry for that child. And so it has been hard, but I am really proud of myself that I got her story out because I don't, I want it to be part of history. It's the journalist in me. Um, I, I want people to know this type of thing can happen and I, I don't want them to ever forget Carissa. So yeah, I guess I, 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 I feel like I was glad I was able to finally do it. I thought about it for a long time and um, I'm glad I, I did it. Well, I'm so glad that I found you, you know, uh, and how I found Sherry uh, for the viewers out there is I was just scrolling on Facebook and Sherry's book came up and just the title don't mommy grab mm -hmm. my attention and I needed to know more. And mm -hmm. I feel that it's deeply important that we get Carissa's story out there and we keep it out there. You know, because there is not enough talk of murders in Canada. This happened in our own country. And I only found out about it because I was scrolling on Facebook and found the book. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Sherry, you did tell me that there was a second book out there on this. Um, uh, one of yeah. the investigators, right? Yeah. So that's a, just sort of another reality that, you know, some of the officers were impacted that worked on this case. And um, one that has PTSD, he uh, he did sort of a, a different take on it, um, but it just kind of speaks to the you know sort of like how that affected them on the inside. Um, the other thing is, I you know when you read books like this, um, it it does make you think about what what are you know what are people capable of. But then some, with Carissa, some, you know, some things live on, like her memory. And the young girls, we didn't talk about that. I interviewed three of her friends who were 12 at the time and are now 27. And those young women, you know, they too um, still honor her. And I think they, one of them wrote me and said, um, after she read it and it was, it was triggering for her. Of course it would be. And in the interviews we did, she said, I'm glad that we learned more about Carissa and the positive because per Penny portrayed her as such an argumentative, argumentative little girl. And so that, I think that really made me feel good. You said, how did it affect me? Like for that, for that one woman who's now works at the Bridgewater hospital, she feels like, her friend has been honored and she can be more at peace. So we have another question here. Are any of the proceeds of this book going towards the family? Uh, I haven't given any to the family. Uh, it was to the veterinarian animal shelter in Carissa's name. 
So Sherry, before we wrap up, I want to lighten it up for the viewers out there. I want to get your T because I'm mm -hmm. sure your T has a lot to do with this story. So if I give you the letters T E A, what words would you give me? Well, I mean, I, I think I'm a caring person who is sensitive to others and, you know, in journalism, those were the kind of stories that always attracted me. Um, you know, I want to help by telling the story of others and help them in their need. I guess that's what I'm about. Mm -hmm. So Sherry, what is the outcome of the book? Where, where would you like to see this book go? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's been thousands and thousands of copies sold. It is on Amazon and, um, where I live, it's in every chapters in Indigo and, and you can order it through that's that store. But um, we've, I've been approached about a podcast and whether we could tell through audio, you know, Carissa's story. So we're, we're thinking about that, but I would never do that without the family's support. So, so Sherry, sharing this story tonight on Tea Time, what doors would you like to have open? I want people to think about a few things, you know. Um, hopefully when people are so frustrated or if they find themselves in that situation, they just walk away. I want to think about our parole system and leave that, you know, have discussion about that because I think that's important. Um you know, what is a life sentence? What should it be? And also to, to think about redemption and can people be rehabilitated? I guess that's where I see the story. Um, just thinking about the different issues at play in this, in this book and um, yeah, just honoring that family. Like crimes have such a horrible impact on so many people. So we have a question here for you, Sherry. Where's Vernon today? Good question. I tried for three years to find Vernon. And um, it was, you know, the fact that I could find the undercover operator and not Vernon tells me that he had to leave our province um, because when Penny said, you know, it was an ultimatum he gave me that made his life horrible. And um, I think he's, I think he may be, provinces away from here, maybe in Ontario where he was born, but he has no public profile and I couldn't, I couldn't find him. He did write to Penny in jail. Um, and then her counselor said that she could not be in a relationship. And that was part of the, um, I think the parole process too, is that she could not have a relationship again. So and if anybody wanted to know more about this story, uh, besides the book, Sherry, where could they find information about it? Hmm. Um, well, if you look online, I think you could find the uh, agreed statement of facts that she signed. And there's lots of media coverage online on YouTube as well. Um, about every time Penny gets a parole pass, like I go, television covers it because it still reverberates in our province. So you could also go on YouTube and search for put in Penny or Carissa's name. And there'll be a lot of, um, you could also see a lot of the memories and videos that her friends did as tributes to her. Um, it's probably the best source. And the last question before we wrap it up, Sherry, how can we find out more about the Carissa bears? Oh, um, well, they're kind of all gone now um is that story um but if someone wanted to reach out to the woman she's in the book um we could put them in touch with her i'm sure we could arrange that because she's she's a very caring person too and is there a location where people can go pay their respects to carissa yes it's um it's on and a lot still do um it's on the lahave river in bridgewater and um, there's a big memorial, um, like a sign with uh, a butterfly over it. Um, and 
yeah, people go there um, to pay their their tributes. Well, I want to thank you, Sherry, for sharing the story and for giving me the opportunity to get the story out there and keeping Caressa's story in the public eye. You know, we don't hear these stories very often and we need to start sharing more of these real life crime stories that are happening, uh, you know. Uh, so I want to thank you, Sherry, for that. I want to thank the audience and the supporters and listeners for tuning in tonight and staying during the trauma and the triggers and, you know, sharing hard stories like this. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank everybody for that. And Sherry, any final words before we say goodbye? Sure. If, if any of your viewers are want to reach out to me, um, I'd be happy to talk to them about the issues of the book. I have a website, SherryAkenhead.com and my email is there. And I, I really do love to hear from the readers. So I, I think you. I've done this book in a very sensitive way. That's what the readers tell me. So it, it's not um, sensational, exploitive. It's it's a real, um, I think, insight in into this tragedy. Well, thank, thank you, you so for much. being here tonight. For all of you who gave up your time to to meet me and talk to me, I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. And I will see everybody for the last 17 times in December. Starting next Thursday, we'll have three new teas. And then the following, we'll have three more. And then we'll have one just before the reunion tea time. So you'll see in December 21st, uh, Miss Liz is hosting a reunion tea time. It is a free event, but Miss Liz is asking for donations so that I can keep promoting and sharing these podcast tea times around the globe. Uh, so stay tuned for more on that. And again, thank you for tuning in. And I will see everybody next Thursday, same time, same place, with three new different teas. Thanks, Miss Liz. Good night.